Well, good afternoon and welcome to our afternoon service here in Cardiff and also live streamed. And before we begin our service, just wanting to remind our folks that the latest uh, bulletin, the bulletin for next month, is available along with the prayer notes and the sermon outlines as well for this afternoon. And this coming Wednesday, Wednesday night, is the uh, Bible study and prayer meeting and uh, still through the electronic means or by telephone and uh, as mentioned before session strongly encourage folks to make use of this uh, means and to have um, to study the word of god together and to have a time of fellowship and uh, the and also i forgot to mention that the mission support for february is the sit uh, synod stipend relief and um and also the details regarding the Anu Congregational Meeting uh, is there also. And all the other important, important information is printed on the bulletin. Thank you. So let us worship God. Let us sing to God's praise by singing from the Scottish Psalter from Psalm 62. Psalm 62 from the Scottish Psalter. And we shall be singing from verses 1 to 6 of that psalm. Verses 1 to 6 of Psalm 62. And here the psalmist is confessing and declaring his expectation, his dependence, not upon his military might or power, as the psalmist King David not in his strength or in his throne, but upon the Lord. My soul with expectation depends on God indeed. My strength and my salvation doth from him alone proceed. And so he has come to realize that it is only God is able to grant him the salvation that he needs. And, uh, and he finds himself in the midst of uh, attacks and uh, the enemies uh, against uh, the anointed and against the Lord. And who? what do they do? Uh, we see in verse 4, they only plot to cast him down from his excellency. They joy in lies with mouth they bless, but they curse inwardly. And so, yes, they may, um, they may bless with their mouth, but they also use that. They curse inwardly. And yes, uh, also the sin of the ninth commandment, as we uh, shall see. But ultimately, it's not just about the enemies against David, it's the enemies against Christ, the anointed of God. And so let us sing to God's praise. Verses 1 to 6 of Psalm 62.
And so let us uh, unite together in prayer. Let us call upon the name of the Lord. Let's pray. O oh, Almighty God and our loving Heavenly Father, O oh God of our salvation, as we join with the uh, psalmist from the psalm that we just sang, that you alone are our expectation and you alone uh, are our salvation. And once again, as we gather uh, this afternoon to worship you on this Lord's Day, as we bow in uh, before your holy presence, and we are reminded, O oh God, uh, of your uh, covenant love and that you have for us as your believing people. And may we be reminded of all that um, Christ has accomplished, all that he has suffered for us in order to open this new and living way that we may come before you and to cry out along with the psalmist of old that my soul with expectation depends on God indeed. And so, Lord, may we come um, to meditate uh, of how, what cost it had upon the Lord Jesus Christ so that we may come so freely uh, by your free and sovereign grace. And we humbly ask that you would... Uh, come among us uh, in this place of worship, this meeting house, by your word and Holy Spirit. Help us, therefore, to truly worship you in spirit and in truth. And we thank you for this occasion once again this afternoon, this uh, time of public worship on this Lord's Day and all the blessings of this Lord's Day and the gathering of believers uh, to join with our uh, brothers and sisters by faith alone, sealed in the blood of Christ. And so as we gather together as your people, we confess, O oh God, um, that uh, uh, that you alone are the one who reigns supreme. And so we praise you. We uh, come to worship and to adore you, all because of your great love towards us in your beloved Son. And so, Lord, as we gather, we acknowledge and we confess that there are so many distractions from uh, the world within our own hearts, even as we... Uh, meet here within the confines of this church building and there are we confess that there are many temptations and the lure of this fleeting world and so we pray that you would uh, be pleased to sovereignly shut that door upon the world for us uh, for we confess that we are weak and feeble unable to do that for ourselves as we were reminded even this morning that we don't even have the strength ourselves to keep watch and pray and so we humbly ask that you would help us and to forget the worldly cares that we may be so uh, caught up with the things of god the precious blessings uh, found in your holy word in the lord jesus christ that we may completely uh, cast all of our cares upon you and so enable us to rise above the things of this world and um, that we may be set free by your holy convicting and also comforting word and we pray that all the attractions of this world would not defile us nor trap us but that we may be so caught up with the lord jesus christ your beloved son to gaze upon his beauty to enjoy the light of uh, your divine presence even now to know of that peace and comfort that's a blessing uh, to our own souls oh gracious god and heavenly father may we be um, may we uh, lay hold uh, of the lord jesus christ by faith alone and to meet him in your holy word and may his uh, presence be so evident here among us that we may know of that uh, joy that exceeding great joy praising him for he is our salvation redemption and sanctification and so govern our hearts and our minds so that we may truly worship you according to your word and so guide us and grant us that love and strength um, uh, to uh, to worship and grant us that, grant us that love uh, for one another but grant us that love above all for you, O oh God, and bless each one of us eh, as we gather here, and also bless all those who gather in different places around the world as part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and bless those who preach the word. And in your mercy, uh, we pray that you will reach out to those who know little or care nothing for your love, and that you would be pleased to save them by your grace, even among us this afternoon. And, Lord, we remember once again those who are not able to guard it here, uh, those who are making use of the electronic means, that they too may know of your divine blessing, your hand upon them, and that they may rejoice with that exceedingly great joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. So help us and bless our time here and our gathering here and, uh, and pardon off our sins, for we ask all these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. <coughs> Well, the scripture reading for this afternoon is from James chapter 3. James chapter 3. James chapter 3. James chapter 3. And I'll read the whole chapter. James chapter 3. So hear the word of the Lord. James chapter 3. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look, at, look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poisons. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a great vine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there uh, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable gentle willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits without uh, partiality and without hypocrisy now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace amen may the lord bless his holy and inerrant word at this point of the service, the offering for the Lord's work is to be received. Well, let us continue our worship by singing from Psalm number 12, 
Psalm number 12 from the Scottish Psalter. Psalm number 12. And we shall be singing from verses 1 to 8 of that psalm. Verses 1 uh, to 8 of Psalm 12. And here there is this plea, this prayer from the people of God. They are they are feeling that they are fading away. They have been under severe uh, trials and attack. Help, Lord, because the godly man doth daily fade away, and from among the sons of men the faithful do decay. And doesn't that remind us of our own days as we seek to be faithful, dear people of God? Um, there is a sense in which there is this fading away, but there is the one whom we can cry out to, call to, uh, and it is the Lord. And he is the one who is able to help. And, how, and, and, and the psalmist describes how bad the situation was, the world that they were in. And to his neighbor, everyone doth utter vanity. They with a double heart do speak, and lips of flattery. And yes, it's basic, all the phrases speaking of, they are lying and uh, sinning against the Lord, even over the ninth commandment. But what does? But God will bring justice. In verses three and four, uh, God shall cut off all flattering lips, tongues that speak proudly thus, will with our tongue prevail. Our lips are ours, whose Lord over us. For poor oppressed for the size of needy rise, I will saith the Lord, and him in safety said, from such as him defy. So the Lord himself um, promises to bring that deliverance and, uh, and even that promise to keep and to preserve his people in verse 7. Lord, thou shalt de them preserve and keep forever from this race. And so let us sing to God's praise the whole Psalm, Psalm 12.
My dear friends, as we know, we live in this postmodern era, a time where objectivity is no longer important, no longer as crucial as subjective feelings. And no doubt, increasingly, as a result, we have heard that our era is also known as a post truth era, a time that objective truth and the notion of truth is increasingly um, rejected and ignored. Isn't it interesting that at this time of internet connectivity and social media, it is also the time of much fake news. Many news reports are no longer reporting how things actually happened, but they turned into editorial comments. And many newspapers and social media platforms, they are not interested in bringing out the truth of the matter, only what the news readers and the audience want to hear. Why? Because to them, truth is not important. Only the profit margins matter. But it is not only uh, it's not only from much of the media, the whole society by and large has sunken into this uh, so-called post-truth era also. And indeed, I'm sure we have heard that there are so many ways to describe someone not telling the truth. Let me mention a number of them. Like what? Telling tall tales? Spending a yarn? Having selective amnesia? Pulling the wool over someone's eye? Pulling someone's leg? Pulling, uh, putting up a front? Or inventing facts? Or some other popular ones, like being economical with the truth? Or telling a terminological inexactitude. Friends, all of these, as we know, are what the world calls nicer ways to say someone is lying. But why? Why do we do that? Because with all of these phrases, we want to, as a society, lessen the meaning and the severity of lying. In our world of so-called alternative facts and selective amnesia, lying is not a big deal. They say, well, politicians do that all the time. Social media has it on a daily basis. The workplace, the school, and in the home are full of it, they say. Everyone does it. But my friends, just because many do it, Many have these colorful, inventive ways to describe lying. Is it therefore then no big deal? What does the Lord have to say about that? Is lying something that is so small and insignificant? And so let us continue on in our series of catechism sermons as we study through the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words of the Lord. And the sermon title for this afternoon is this, Lying and the Ninth Commandment, uh, the Ninth Word. Lying and the Ninth Word. As we look at the ninth, uh, ninth Commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. <coughs> and by God's grace and with his help, we shall be looking at the book of James, chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. With the help of our instructors, Lord's Day Thought 43 of the Heidelberg Catechism as well as our Westminster Shorter Catechism 78. Uh, they are found on the um, out sermon outline. And we shall do so under the three thoughts. 
Firstly, the tremendous power of the tongue. Secondly, the transgressions of the tongue. And thirdly and finally, the taming of the tongue. Lying on the ninth word, the tremendous power of the tongue, the transgressions of the tongue, and finally, the taming of the tongue. Well, my dear friends, this afternoon, the word of God here in the book of James invites us to look at an organ in the body that we all have, no matter how old or how young we are, no matter whatever background we came from, even the newborn babies in our congregation have been blessed with. Something that we all use on a daily basis, even from the day we were born and started crying. My friends, is it not this physical organ of the tongue? And there are a number of things that we can say about this member of our body. For one thing, we see that this is a small member. It is not as big as our livers or stomachs or the largest organ of the human body. And the doctors here would be able to say our skin. No, it is a small organ that is able to hide behind our teeth in our mouths. Other people and our loved ones at home don't usually see the whole of it. Many times it seems to be so hidden away. On the surface, it seems so insignificant. And in fact, here, James, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is comparing the tongue to bits in horses' mouths and a small rudder of a ship. And those things are also insignificant on the surface. I mean, how many of us, when we go to a horse farm, that we would spot immediately the bits in the horse's mouths? That's not the first thing we see. And how many of us, when we go to a dock, eh, that we would first discover the rudder of the ship is usually hidden away in the water. And so it is with the appearance of the tongue. However insignificant the human tongue seems, it has tremendous power. And so let us look at our first point, the tremendous power of the tongue. The tremendous power. And in here, James invites us to consider two things. First of all, we are to consider the bits in horses' mouths. For we can read in verse 3, it says, Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. And friends, I'm sure many of us and many of the children here have seen horses. And these are not small animals like a rabbit or even a kangaroo. It is a large animal. The average adult horse weighs between 380 kilos to 1,000 kilos. Not only that, horses are known for their strength and speed. In fact, in the days of James, horses were used for battles and for transportation. And is it not even in our own language to evaluate the speed of our motor vehicles still by the horse power? Yes, if we are not familiar uh, with horses, we would stay away if we don't know much about them because we can easily get injured if they run into, a, into us. And in fact, there are news reports from time to time of fatal injuries from horses even in our own days. Maybe at this point we may be wondering, well, how is it possible to control such big... <coughs> Big beasts. And this is when we are told that the bits in the horse's mouth, a small piece of metal that is put in the mouth of a horse, these bits can make even a 1,000 kilo horse to slow down, to run fast, to turn to whatever direction, and to bring the animal to a complete stop. And James is comparing the bit in the horse's mouth to the human tongue. But that is not the only picture. 
we see here. This, we have also another picture, as mentioned before, the rudder of a ship. And we can read of that in verse 4 of our text. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Friends, I wonder if we have been on a boat. A rudder can be seen at the back of the boat, but not only small fishing boats do we see that. Even big ships, and maybe some of us have been on cruises, and or maybe we have at least seen them at either the cruise terminal in Newcastle or down in Sydney. Those cruises, as we know, they're not tiny boats or even yachts. They are massive. And I remember when my children were even smaller, we took them to the rocks down, down in Sydney. And there, as we walked past those gigantic cruises and some of my children wondered if they were buildings or actually ships so big and some of those big sh uh, cruises can host up to 6,000 passengers with plenty of room and on the surface it seems so impossible to move this uh, cruise but with a rudder, the pilot can control the direction of such a powerful and massive ship however the pilot wants. And in that light do we see the tremendous power these seemingly, seemingly small things have. The little metal bit in horses' mouths and a small rudder of a ship. And so it is with a small organ of the tongue. In other words, James is saying that the tongue, though disproportionately small, has a disproportionately large influence on us as people. It has tremendous power and influence on us. It is powerful, and the tongue can bring forth good influence. Even Proverbs chapter 10, verse 11, the first part reminds us Proverbs 10, verse 11, the mouth of the righteous is a well of life. I mean, think about it. In all of our educational life, how much the tongue is needed, as it were, through uh, the tongues of our teachers, professors, educators. Knowledge is passed on to us through that. And even in the home between parents and children, how much of that parental guidance and instruction is through the tongue? And also in the workplace and in relationships, how much the tongue can be for good when uh, with a word of comfort, a word of consolation, a word of encouragement, a word of love, and a word of appreciation. In those situations, do we see how much good this little member of our body can bring to one another? And not only that, but even with the ordained means of the preaching of the gospel, which is taking place right here, right now, that God is pleased to use the tongue to bring sinners to salvation, to afflict the comfortable to, and to comfort the afflicted. And when we see, and we see that even with the reading and the singing of the word of God also. And in that, do we see how much good, how much saving good under the divine blessing of God, the tongue can bring and the tongue can, do, can be a power of good. But at the same time, <coughs> the tongue can be a power of evil. <gasps> Friends, I'm sure even many children would understand the evil that the tongue can bring. Because we can hurt someone with our words. And even as a child, I can recall those occasions that I brought my, with, a, with my tongue, I brought my patient, loving, godly mother to tears, just with that tongue. And indeed, uh, this little member of the body can bring so much damage in dishonoring our parents, 
<coughs> in breaking down relationships, in hurting our loved ones. Friends, there is a tremendous power of the tongue. Just think of the imageries here in James. Think of the abuse of it. The abuse of the bits in the horse's mouth can bring the horse and the rider off the cliff. And the abuse of the rudder of a ship can bring about a shipwreck. And so much more so it is with this seemingly little member of our body, the tongue. It can ruin many, many homes. It can destroy many, many marriages. It can bring down the reputation of others. And it can destroy someone's livelihood and someone's life even. And in here, James wants us to see the great danger that the tongue can bring. And we can read that uh, from verse 5. It says, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. My dear friends, as we live in Australia, we notice, well, don't we? Because Australia, as we know, is a very dry country. Even the bushfire from last year uh, should be a very uh, vivid reminder to us of how dangerous it can be. The whole bushfire throughout many parts of our states and, and in other states, they didn't start with a fireball, massive fireball, but a little flame. And do we remember the terrifying footage on the news and on social media? For some of them, the fire spread so quickly, so fast, that even the roads to other major towns and cities were completely blocked off. Some of them had to be evacuated to the local beach, and some decided to stay and defend. It was completely out of control. And it all started with a little flame or spark that as little as our fingertips. Think of the damages it has brought. I just had a quick look at the statistics regarding just the 2019 and 2020 bushfire. 18.6 million hectares were burned. Over 5,900 buildings, including 2,779 homes were destroyed and 34 people were killed. Even right now, nearly a year on, the recovery effort is still ongoing and some of the places will never be the same again. Families would have to face the empty chairs as a result of the bushfire. And so much more so it is with the tongue, it can bring greater damages and destruction. And we also see the tremendous impossibility in taming the tongue. For we read in verses 7 and 8, it says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. My dear friends in here, James is giving us another picture, pictures of animals, not just a little sheep and goat, or little bilbies. No, even large and fearsome animals in the wild, like what? Like tiger, like lions, large animals like elephants. Mankind can train them. Mankind can tame them. Maybe even some of our children here would know in the zoo, or even in the aquarium with sharks and whales. We see many zookeepers are able to train animals that are not normally domesticated uh, animals, and that they were able to do amazing tricks. Even lions jumping through hoops of fire in the circus. And as wild as they may be, man can tame those animals. But yet the word of God 
tells us that no man is able to tame or to stop the tongue from evil. Have we really, have we truly thought about this? Have we ever been brought to that realization? Say, for example, when we go to the zoo or to see a circus show, rather than being so amazed by what the animals there can do, have we been brought to that humble realization, the realization of our misery? What is it? As we look at those circus animals and how skilled those circus people do we say to ourselves, even the most skilled circus person cannot tame my evil tongue because of my sin. My dear friends, we use the tongue a lot. We use it every single day. We can say a lot of things, even in different languages, maybe for some of us. But has the Lord revealed the true state of our tongues to you and to me? by our sinful nature, rather than saying, just like the unbelieving world around us, <coughs> saying, no big deal, who cares? Words don't matter, words just words. We are all guilty of this, so what? Rather than that, have we, by the Holy Spirit's grace, come to see what, and come to say what Isaiah of, of old I saw the glory, the majesty, the holiness of God on his throne. Even those sinless, remember, sinless angels, they had to cover their faces and to cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And what did Isaiah cry out in Isaiah 6, verse 5? Not covering up, but a confession before the Lord. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. My dear friends, is that your and my confession, even this afternoon before the Lord? And secondly, we are to see the transgressions of the tongue, the transgressions of the tongue. My dear friends, James wants us to see the evil and the iniquity that our tongue can do, can produce. And we can read in verse 9 and the beginning of verse 10 of our text. We read, With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. Do we see how searching this truth is, even regarding the sin of the tongue? We are told we can bless God with it, and we can curse other image bearers with it. In other words, we can attend the worship of God. We can have, we can sing the songs of Zion. We can bless God in prayer. We can thank him with our lips. We can have a mouth full of questions concerning the Bible. We can have a mouth full of verbal confessions concerning Christ. Full, a mouth full of reformed orthodoxy. But then we can issue bitter, hateful words as soon as the public worship ends. And this is what the word of God is telling us. What our tongues are capable of. One moment we can bless God, sing hallelujah to the Lord. But the next moment we can hurt and curse another image bearer of the Almighty God. And that really tells us that the transgressions, the sins of the tongue have a very deep root problem. Deeper than the muscle in our tongue because it is a heart problem. The reason why our tongue is an unruly evil is because by nature we have a bad, bad heart. A heart that is transgressing the ninth commandment as well as all the other commandments. And what are some of the ways? 
Well, our, our instructor, the Heidelberg Catechism, in answer 112, helpfully outlines five main areas through which we can transgress the ninth commandment. And it's printed on the, the outline. Firstly, we can transgress the ninth commandment by giving false testimony against our neighbor. And that is what the ninth commandment itself pictures for us, as it says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And in here we are given the picture of a courtroom before a judge. And the justice system in ancient Israel is a bit different than the justice system in our own land. The elders of the city will be called upon and then the court will be in session. <coughs> and in those times, in ancient Israel, there were no barristers, there were no lawyers, and those who were charged with a crime, they were not presumed innocent until proven guilty, no, but presumed guilty until proven innocent. And remember, there, was, there were no fingerprints, no forensic team to provide evidence, and so we can see that nearly everything is dependent on witnesses on the testimony of two or three people and those and that people could put to death can be put to death for serious crimes on that basis and therefore in many of the situations it came down to one person's word against another and for those crimes that were treated as capital offenses the defendant's life was was at stake and the words of a false witness could be so very fatal yes in the situation of a false witness it could be that the false witness deep down hated his or her neighbor or wanting to get rid of that person to bring a false allegation to bring a false accusation against the person or that the false witness was paid by someone else to do the dirty work. And so do we see why the ninth commandment is needed? But there is another protection concerning the execution of judgment. And if the person was to be sentenced to death, the accuser, according to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 7, the accuser was to throw the first stone and that is another safeguard. For in the case of false allegation, the conscience of the false witness should trouble him or her. Why? Because it is one thing to accuse someone, but quite another to put another person to death. Because the conscience should show and tell the all-knowing God is watching. And indeed, if the accuser is proved to be a false witness and if the judge finds that out that false witness is to be punished with the same punishment inflicted on the accused Deuteronomy chapter 19 Deuteronomy 19 verses 18 to 19 says and the judges shall make careful inquiry and indeed if the witness is a false witness who has testified falsely against his brother then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. So you shall put away the evil from among you. And the second transgression of the tongue is twisting someone's words. Twisting someone's words. And yes, this can happen outside of the courtroom. And that means falsifying another person's words. In what way? We can leave out certain facts that color the truth about another person, about what he or she has said. We can change certain words or even a phrase. Or maybe we just spoke word for word, but simply with a different tone of voice and thus conveying a different message. Whatever way that we are misrepresenting another person, we are falsifying a man's words, for we are taking things out of context. 
And that is lying. That is a transgression of the ninth commandment. Why? Because when we do that, either by exaggerating or minimizing or by implying false motives, we are then bearing false witness. Because in that, the motive of our hearts and the motion of our tongue, they are not aimed at honoring God and loving our neighbors. Simply seeking to bring down another person's reputation and thus elevating ourselves. And in that situation, we are transgressing the ninth commandment. And the third transgression of the tongue is gossiping and slandering. Gossiping and slandering. Yes, what are they? Slandering and gossiping. They are words spoken behind someone's back. What is being said may not always be false. It could be true, but it is said to the wrong person for the wrong reason. It is never aimed to build up the person talked, up, <coughs> the person talked about, but simply to injure that person's reputation and to bring his or her name down. My friends, have we ever thought? Have we ever thought about why people gossip in the first place? And it is far beyond just a modern trend. Well, everyone loves juicy gossips. Far beyond that. There are two main reasons for it. People gossip in the first place is out of the idolatrous self-love. How do we know that? Because in those moments when we gossip, we are actually not concerned about the person we gossip about. Not at all. Not, not really. We want to make ourselves look good. And dear congregation, let us be reminded of this. Each time we gossip, we are actually committing false worship, the idolatry of self. Because we are willing, so willing, to sacrifice the reputation and the names of others on our flimsy altar of self in order to boost and to serve our own name and ego. And this is an abomination before the sight of God. It is never as many in the world, sadly, some in the church may say, oh, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. No, far beyond that. And that comes from the heart of pride. Second thing, the heart of pride. Because in gossiping, in slandering another person, we want to take one seat. We take the seat that only God deserves, the judgment seat. We assume that we know everything about that person, that we are so proud, and that we serve as jury, as witnesses, but also as a judge. Friends, God has not ordained that place of justice to the individual human being, not even to the individual Christians. But through either the keys given to the church and the sword given to the state as his ministers and they are accountable to him as the judge of all. And this is a solemn thing that you and I must be absolutely vigilant about. Especially we live in a world that prizes gossip, tabloid, magazines, insiders, information, WikiLeaks. We may not see that gossiping as so great a sin against God, but it is a moment of curiosity and interest. It is a transgression against God. It can turn even into a, a long term, a long time of pain and division, not just in families, homes, but even in the body of Christ. And the fourth transgression of the ninth commandment is condemning anyone rashly or unheard. Condemning anyone rashly or unheard. Friends, I'm afraid this is an epidemic. It is epidemic in our world. For we so easily give judgment to pass on our condemnation without even hearing or approaching the person concerned and asking them uh, before we can we even ask them about all the circumstances of the situation 
And we may be quite appalled at the judicial systems in closed and communist countries because they have no, we know, they have no fair trials, no true uh, rule of law, no fairness. But when we condemn others rashly or unheard, we are doing exactly the same. Proverbs 18, verse 13 reminds us, Proverbs 18, verse 13, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. And so my dear friends, especially those of us who name the name of Christ, have we also fallen into this folly and shame? And how much we need the grace of God to forgive us, to pardon us, to cleanse us. And the fifth transgression of the ninth commandment is all kinds of lying and deceit. All kinds of lying and deceit. Friends, it is all kinds of lying that the commandment, the ninth commandment warns us against. Not just some of the lies or most of the lies, but all of the lies. Yes, even the so-called white lies. And I'm afraid this is one of the great sins that is plaguing the Church of Christ in the West. And the great mystery is that many professing Christians are absolutely unconscious, or worse, even the consciences, the consciences are so seared that many simply do not care to tell a little white lie, to keep us from embarrassment, from, to keep us from awkward social situations, to tell a white lie so that we may be perceived better by others, by exaggeration about our accomplishments. Lying out of malice, lying out of fear, lying for profit, lying to cover lies that have already been lied lying out of neglect, or maybe lying by having a double face, double heart, <coughs> especially in social situations. We could slander and gossip about one particular person, but when we see that person face to face, we act as if we are the best of mates. And what would those who know that double face of ours, what would they say about us? What would our children say about us? My mum and dad, well, they have their outdoor faces, all for pretense. I can do that too. Well, they have done it. And friends, do we see what that will lead to? That is actually one of the best ways to raise up little Pharisees, little hypocrites. And even when we try to tell our children or other loved ones the truth of the gospel, what will they say? How can I believe you? I've known, I've known you as nothing but a liar. You tell me it's the truth? I don't believe you. And do we see, dear congregation, in all of these transgressions that we have covered, do we see whose reputation ultimately is at stake? through our transgressions. It is God. His name is dishonored. His word is doubted because of our transgressions of the ninth commandment. In that light do we see why even the little white lies are an abomination in the sight of God. Because God is the God of truth. He himself is the truth. And when we tell lies, we, when we transgress the ninth commandment, we are actually doing something else. We are acknowledging someone else as our Lord and Father. As Jesus himself declares in the Gospel of John, John chapter 8, verse 44, the Lord Jesus says, You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. And this is why in James chapter 3, we are reminded of the severity of the sin of lying. It is worse than the bushfires in Australia. 
It is the fire of hell that we read in verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is to set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. And so, my dear friends, do we see how serious this is? The untamed tongue, if it is not bridled into that true obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, this unbridled, untamed tongue will bring down upon the sinner the the heavy wrath of God. (coughs) And the book of Revelation, Revelation tells us there is a place for those who are liars with untamed tongues. In the second half of verse 8 in Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 8. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Why is this sin so severe? Because, my dear friends, All lying has the same country of origin. Not heaven, but hell. And the greatest mystery, the greatest harm that we can do to ourselves is to lie to our own selves. What way? When we we lie to ourselves when we think that we can go unconverted in our life. That we can go with our sins unconfessed, thinking that we can go to heaven without Christ. That is indeed the greatest lie that the father of lies, Satan, the accuser of the brethren, wants us to believe in. Have we come to see how serious this is? And let us look at our third and final point, the taming of the tongue. The taming of the tongue. And maybe some of us, when we're confronted with this searching truth, we're reminded of those solemn words in verse 8 of our text in James. But no man can tame um, the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And we may be brought to this sense of hopelessness as we are confronted by this solemn truth that we cannot, no matter how hard we try, that we cannot tame this evil in our body. But friends, even though there is no hope in ourselves, it doesn't mean that there can be no hope offered to us. Yes, it is impossible with man, but it is possible with Christ. And thanks be to God for that. For Christ is the one who can tame the tongues of his sinful people. The Lord Jesus, the embodiment of truth himself, He had to come to this world like a world of sin and lies. And he is not only God, but as verse 2 of our text reminds us, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle the whole body. Friends, never has Christ had a slip of the tongue throughout his earthly life. Even at that, throughout all, at all points, he never bore false witness. He never gossiped. He never slandered, nor did he judge rashly. But yet he had to endure false witnesses accusing him of lying, accusing him of blasphemy, accusing him of being a drunkard, accusing him of breaking the ninth commandment. And yes, even 1 Peter chapter 2 Verse 23 reminds us, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Yes, all the way to the cross of Calvary, to die a death that he never ever deserved, to shed his own precious blood. In all, why? In order to pay for his lying, slanderous, judgmental sinners. Oh, my dear lying friends, there is hope of salvation even for you and for me. There is full forgiveness in the blood of Jesus Christ, even this afternoon. And so shall we not flee to him, cling to him in repentance and faith, in all honesty? 
holding nothing back, going to him with all of our sins, confessing to him our lying tongues and our lying hearts, so that not only will we know the forgiveness of our sins, but even not, not just the, the sin forgiveness of the sin over the ninth commandment, but also to have our tongues tamed by him, <coughs> so that we may speak truth with our neighbor to the glory of our triune God, not only with our tongues, but with our hearts, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ continuously. Oh, may the Lord guide us that we may know that blessing, that preciousness of his grace. Amen. And let us conclude our worship by singing from Psalm 50 from the Scottish Psalter. <coughs> Psalm 50 from the Scottish Psalter. The first version. And we shall be singing from verses 18 to 23. Verses 18 to 23. And here we are seeing pictures of the wicked, thieves and adulterers and liars. And they thought they were all, all okay. When thou a thief did see, with him thou didst consent, and with the vile adulterers partaker on thou went. Thou givest thy mouth to ill, thy tongue deceit doth frame. Thou sitteth and gainst thy brother, uh, against thy brother speakst, thy mother's son doth shame. Yes, even to, all, with all sort of lying, deceit and, and shame, speaking against uh, their brother, their neighbor. And, uh, and we see what God says there in verse 21, because I silence kept, while thou these things hast wrought, that I was altogether like thyself have been a thy thought. Yet I will thee reprove and set before thine eyes in order ranked and thy misdeeds and thine iniquities. So God is reminding that um, there is a consequence, there is that judgment. He is the one who is righteous. Now ye that God forget, this carefully consider, lest I pieces tear you all, and none can you deliver. But yet there is a, a blessing for those who lay hold of him, who seek him, who praises him, who confess to him, even the lying hearts and tongues. Whoso doth offer praise, me glorifies, and I will show him God's salvation that orders right his way in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let us sing as, and stand to sing to God's praise, 18 to the end. <laughs>
So now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.